Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. One Night, Five Murders, Part One. So, hey, Wendy, why don't you tell the listeners what they're going to hear in the next two episodes of the Murder Police podcast? Okay. We have called this episode One Night, Five Murders, because that's just what it is. It's a two-part series. This covers a crime that occurred April 23rd, 1986, by two women, believe it or not, Ella Fonda Faye Foster and Tina Powell, and they murdered five victims in one night. Wow. What, what's the names and the ages, too? Because one of the things I like about the oral history that we're creating with these is that this is in 1986. There's no Google search. There's no pictures. I, we can't even find family and Fran couldn't find or think of family. So I want to make sure that we memorialize these victims the way they should be by name. If you want to read those off, they'd be great. Yeah. And let me start with saying, as you mentioned, Fran, Fran is the lead investigator on this. As he was, if our listeners recall, the Michael Turpin case, Fran was lead investigator on that one as well. And if you've not listened to the Michael Turpin case, please go ahead and listen to that as well. That case is just as full of twists and turns as this case is. But our victims, Carlos Kearns, age 73, was a victim, as well as his wife, Virginia Kearns, age 45, Trudy Harrell, age 59, Jimmy Roger Keene, age 47, and Theodore Sweet, age 52. So we had three male victims and two female victims, and all of these victims were murdered by these two females. Very interesting. Can't wait to have the audience get the details of that. And I think they'll find, too, that Fran was pretty sure after these calls just kept coming in. If you can imagine going to an investigation scene yourself and getting started in this investigation, it's a death investigation, and the phone or the radio goes off and says, oh, by the way, over here we have another body, what that must have felt like. Yeah, and as Fran recalls it, it was a crazy night because they had the two victims, and while they were working those, the call came for the last three victims, and those three victims were found together. So he ended up on the third call finding three more victims for a total of five. And it was a very crazy night for him, as he will reflect. Yeah, and that's very bizarre for people to know Lexington, Kentucky. Very bizarre. Even to this day, that would be a bizarre scene. It would. That's just not something that happens around here. We do have our share of crime and murder. Thank thank goodness it's not uh, as terrible as some areas. But in this night for five in one night in Lexington, and they're all related, it it really threw Fran and the rest of the uh, homicide unit for, for quite the loop. Well, great. Well, let's get started and jump right into the interview for episode one of the One Night, Five Murders. All right. Hi, Fran. Thank you so much for joining us today. We sure enjoyed having you at the podcast that we recorded on the murder of Michael Turpin that you had worked. So thank you for coming back. Well, thank you for the invite. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you again. And tell us a little bit about yourself for those for the audience who hasn't had the, the honors of listening to your previous podcast with us. Well, I believe the the police slang would be I'm I'm the old police. Uh, I started my career in 1973 and very quickly went into investigations and did some time with uh, general investigations and then special investigations. And uh, then I went back out to the street. Most fun I had after I really, really knew what I was doing then. And uh, and guys were calling me asking for advice on how do I write this search warrant and this and that. And so that was a very pleasant three years. But uh, then I made the mistake of accepting a promotion and going back into detectives, uh, running the robbery homicide squad. And, and, of course, that's a lot different than working the street. They both got their pros and cons, but the pressure, the 
tension of working homicides all the time is, is uh, something that will catch up to you. I'd say so, but you certainly excelled in it from what I've heard of your previous tells, and certainly this case that we're going to talk about today. I saw you in the past featuring this, and it it is certainly a very crazy case. I can't imagine the night that you had with all of this that that the night that it occurred. So with that being said, why don't you tell us a little bit what this case is about? Well, I had already been called out. Matter of fact, I was out with my wife and and another one of my detectives and his wife. We were celebrating his birthday, and I got called out to Nancy Hanks on a, on a barricaded person SWAT call out type of thing, and and so I'm only there about a half an hour when they notify me that they've got a dead body uh, over in the Burke Plaza. This was probably close to nine o'clock. Yeah, it was nine o'clock. That evening on uh, Wednesday, August 23rd, 1986. So I responded to, uh, to that, and, and immediately upon seeing the body, there was trauma everywhere. Uh, clothes ripped off, uh, tire tracks, scuff marks in the parking lot, apparent bullet holes in the victim, as well as uh, some rather odd knife wounds. So the first thing I did was I called out the Commonwealth Attorney and uh, and I called out the Associate Chief Medical Examiner, John uh, Hunsacker, to the scene, which is pretty unusual that you could get the medical examiner to the scene. But I knew there was odd enough things there that that he would appreciate being able to see it before the body was handled and and uh, and delivered to him. So uh, they both arrived pretty quickly and told me right off the bat that it was going to be a bad night was Dr. Hunsaker gets up to the body and he's got his ditty bag and amongst things is his camera equipment and he gets his camera out and he kind of focuses on the body but then he immediately brings the camera straight up over his head and shoots a picture of the full moon that's over us. So uh, that was kind of a clue. You know, it was weird enough already. The clothing was off, was something that you just didn't see that much. Uh, just looked like old uh, Goodwill stuff, uh, uh, Lala polyester and, and things that you'd see. And it just kind of stood out. It, he didn't see many people dressing that way at that time anyways, in the mid-'80s. We continue to work that scene, and there is a lot of physical evidence. The best thing that we did at that scene was we called Canine to try to do an article search. Pat Murray arrived with his dog. I'm sorry, I can't remember the dog's name at this point. But they do an article search, and within uh, 20 minutes, they have found the one of the original crime scenes which was over on the other side of a hedge grow. We could see it from the Burt Plaza parking lot, but uh, it, it was completely in the dark over there. It was a little dirt road that kind of led in behind that hedge row, and uh, they found a, a large amount of, of evidence, and especially including scuff marks and tire tracks. That type of thing. I think they recovered a few uh, 22 caliber shell casings. There was a good amount of blood there, too. And, of course, what we learned that we were going to be tracking all night was a few packets of orange uh, Trojan condoms. Ended up nicknaming this case the, the Trojan Trail, I'm afraid, because we found them at about every scene that we went to that night and e- even in the weeks to follow. So was this victim, was it a male or female victim that you found? A female there, Trudy Harrell. Trudy Harrell, Mm -hmm. okay. Trudy was our first one. She was uh, 58 years old. Uh, She was the only, well, no, she was one of two of them that weren't drunk. Their blood alcohols came back zeros. And she, like most of the victims, lived over on Jennifer Court in one of the apartments over there. So when you found... Trudy, you had, did you know who it was? Was there ID laying about or? No, there was not. We, we had nothing to identify her with at that point. So you have an unknown victim. How, how do you go about solving who she is? 
at that point. And then I guess which takes us into how your case unwound that night, because it certainly got a lot crazier as your night went on. Uh, that it did. Uh, you know, you do what you have to do at a crime scene. You don't start, you know, you're, you're not like the dog in, in the cartoon that, that goes squirrel all the time. Uh, you take care of what you have in hand, especially before it can be destroyed or, or altered. And so working a large crime scene like that, it, it took us a good couple of hours before we ever thought about going anywhere else with it. And at that time, we got diverted to another dead body. And we got there pretty quickly because it was fairly close over in the Woodhill area and behind the what at that time was the Foy Johnson paint store. There's a little alley that ran in behind the strip mall there. And another body wearing almost identical clothing, the polyester balloon pants and the like, had the exact same trauma, uh, had bullet wounds, knife wounds, and, the, and once again, the knife wounds were odd. It was also apparent that she had been run over, and uh, there was scuff marks on the pavement, and uh, there was burnt rubber uh, from the tires across her body. And once again, it was almost like going to the same crime scene again, just a, just a different place. Well, we didn't get to stay there for more than 20 minutes, and we had a call of three more bodies. Uh, this time, a pretty good little ways out Richmond Road, at a, in behind a field that was behind, at that time, the Belcher's Liquor Store, well-known landmark. You could buy your bullets and your booze at the same place. Bullets, guns, and booze. So that didn't happen very often back then. And at that place, we had a car on fire. It was parked on top of a rather large man, male victim, and there were bodies immediately around it, all three of them having significant burn marks and, and everything to their body. One, one of the victims found there, the oldest of the victims, Carlos Kearns, was transported across the street to the, at that time, Humana Hospital, and, but he died fairly quickly in the emergency room there. So just to keep count, we're up to five bodies Yes, in one evening. And what do you think the time span was from one to the fifth one? At Nine o'clock. The last ones were called in about uh, one. Eleven o'clock is uh, the Codell Drive one. And just after midnight on Thursday, the following day, is when we were called to the fire scene. Had you ever had an evening like that before or a day like that before when you did those cases where it's just one after another, like there's a coupon in the paper? Or? No, certainly uh you don't deal with many spree killings, and I think that would be the proper classification of this one as opposed to being any of the others. So, And that's what a spree killing looks like. They go from one place to another to another. And at that point, we still had very little information about what was behind it. I don't know that I can tell you the why of it even now that over the next weeks, we we uh, learned quite a bit, but as to why it happened, we didn't pick up on. So you have these five victims, and I'm guessing you're, since this is really not, like you said, a, a common occurrence in Lexington that you have these spree killings, you're feeling, I'm sure, that they're all connected. Well, yeah. Especially it, the first two, since they were so similar. Well, the the males were so similar, too. They they had been run over. They had been shot. They had been stabbed. And again, it's, it's an odd stabbing pattern where these blade wounds, there would be two right within a couple of millimeters of each other spaced around the body. And come to find out that they had a buck uh, folding hunter type knife, very popular knife back then because the blades would lock into place. And this one had two blades that extended out of the same end of the knife. Very, very different kind of knife. I, I had certainly not seen one before that, and I hadn't seen one since. Uh, unless it's a Swiss Army knife or something like that that has multiple tools. But this was your typical folding hunter type of knife, wood handle and brass ends and, and uh, lock blades. 
and one blade was wider and longer than the other blade. So it made very identical and very identifiable wounds that that uh especially at autopsy you could you could see very clearly what was going on but even out in the middle of the night you could still tell that there was something out of the ordinary there hey murder police podcast fans it's david and i wanted to take just a minute of your time to recommend three local podcasts from my area that i thoroughly enjoy and i think you'll enjoy them too The first one is called the Speaking of Harvey podcast. It's from a friend of mine named Scott Harvey, and he speaks to the topic of public speaking and what it would be like to move a career in that direction. But he also talks a great deal of entrepreneurship, business startups, side gigs, things like that. And I would say that if you speak to groups of people for any reason, whether you're a teacher or a presenter or anything like that, give the Speaking of Harvey podcast a listen. You're going to walk away with a lot of really good tips and information from that one. The second one I want to recommend is the Uncommon History of the South podcast. It's a fantastic local Kentucky history podcast that offers details that are amazing about the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's actually on my go-to list, and it's one of those podcasts for me personally that I wait for the next episode to come out. So give the Uncommon History of the South podcast a listen and see if you enjoy it too. The third one, and not the last one in any kind of order, is called the Lexington Podcast. And this is done by a brother and sister here in Lexington, Kentucky. And they do an excellent job of talking about the history of Lexington, Kentucky, and then they entertain the contemporary lifestyle and things going on in Lexington, Kentucky. Excellently recorded, excellently produced. The content is amazing. It's another one that you'll really enjoy listening to. As a matter of fact, they actually covered the Michael Turpin murder and did it wonderfully. And they've actually done a real good job on covering a book called The Bluegrass Conspiracy. And for those from the Kentucky area, you know what that's about. And Erica and Jonathan do great justice to covering that. That's it. We'll get back to the show, but I wanted to recommend those to you. Thank you. So at this point, you have two female victims, and the last three were those all male? All male, yes. Okay. So now you have these five victims. Have you at this point identified any of them? Uh, no. Uh, although the car that is parked on top of them comes back to a Carlos Kearns over on Jennifer Court. And he was one of your victims. And he was, he was the victim that was transported to the hospital. Carlos was the oldest of them. He was 72. And like Trudy Harrell, uh, he had no alcohol in his system. So that, that was the only... That was the odd thing about this group because the rest of them were pretty heavy drinkers. So where does a detective start if you don't know names except for one? They're all similar. How do you even start to figure out a motive, let alone who your suspects are or is? Well, in this case, we had an incredible amount of luck because at before I'm even arriving, at the third scene, at, at the Belcher liquor scene, Captain Potts and Captain Kitchen, they had both come out when they heard about the first two murders, and they happened to go over to Humana Hospital right across the street, and they knew that one of the victims was transported there. Well, there they run into these two women that since then we have nicknamed the Sunshine Sisters just because of their general disposition, but uh, that's where we located LaFonda Faye Foster and Tina Powell. Both of them were intoxicated. Uh, They weren't falling down drunk, but they had certainly been drinking. And both of them had apparent blood all over their clothing. And they were at the hospital. They went to the hospital to use the bathroom there to try to clean up and uh, just ran into the police there. Uh, It's just so it's like I say, you know, I, I would take that kind of luck every day. Well, sure, because <laughs> these end up, not to give the spoiler alert here, but these end up being your suspects mm-hmm. who who killed all five of these people. Do you think, in your professional opinion, had these two women not been there, would it have been a difficult one to solve? Or how would you have even begun to solve who killed all five people? Was there enough DNA certainly wasn't around then. No, there wasn't DNA, and and uh, some of the blood testing that we did, uh, you know, we didn't have much luck there because uh, many of them had similar type blood, uh, even down to eight or nine antigens. But 
the car was the key. Uh, we, in hindsight, we we located several locations during the night where that car was and who was in it and what they were doing, and and we could put all five of the victims and the two suspects in that car. So when this officer sees the two the two women, well, with the blood soaked on them, I'm sure that raised a lot of suspicion. But what does he do? At that point, and were you notified that there were two potential suspects? We were notified that there were two potential suspects. Uh, they were hauled down to the Fayette County Detention Center uh, individually. Once again, the Trojan Trail shows up. Okay, Fran, before we dig in to the case, why don't you tell us a little bit about these five victims that you stumbled upon this, this evening? First victim was Trudy Harrell. She was a female white. 58 years of age, uh, had not been drinking, but she lived on 1744 Jennifer Court in apartment C2. Then the second one that we had immediately after that was Virginia Kearns, female white, 45 years of age, the youngest of the victims, and uh, she ended up having a blood alcohol of 0.32 but also with the same address of 1744 Jennifer Apartment C2. Out to the Squires Road Belcher Liquor uh, scene was where he had been transported just before I got there, Carlos Kearns, who is the official resident and uh, husband of Virginia Kearns on Jennifer Court. And he was 71 years of age and, again, had not been drinking. Underneath the car was uh, Roger Keene, male white, 47. Uh, He was a very large man, and I think that's why the car ended up being burned instead of taken somewhere else, because it was stuck on him, and apparently they they could not get it unstuck. Uh, He was a big guy, so he was pinned underneath the car. Uh, Roger had a blood alcohol of .22. And he, too, lived at the same building on Jennifer Court, only he was in an apartment C4. Uh, The last victim, he was over to the side of the car, but he had burn marks. And and again, all of them had been run over. All of them had been stabbed with this unique knife pattern. And all of them had been shot. Very small caliber uh, bullet wounds. Ted Sweet lived on uh, the near 3rd and Jefferson. Do you know anything about uh, them personally or professionally, or what they did for a living or their lifestyles or anything? Or? Well, we know Roger Keene had just been released from uh, jail from the Fayette County Detention Center, one of his many uh, alcohol intoxication charges. Most of these people had records, very minor disorderly conduct or alcohol intoxication, that, that type of charge, uh, numerous ones. Okay, so you get to the Squires Road scene, and you have three victims there, and there's a decent amount of evidence there. Why don't you tell us about what you found there? Well, we found a handgun, a a handgun, uh, that was missing. It was a little Saturday night special twenty-two long rifle weapon. Now, all the twenty-two casings that we found were short or or at the best long uh, caliber twenty-two casings. And then come to find out on our wounds and everything that they, many of them were very shallow. The ones to the heads uh, generally bounced off the skull. So that, that was just this subpar ammunition that the girls were using. And, you know, we confirmed later on that they were scrounging to, to get ammunition at various locations. So you have the five victims and now you also have the two suspects. At that point, do you go down yourself to interview the suspects, or are you still on scene with the medical examiner? I'm still on scene with the medical examiner. My way of thinking, I, I dispatched other detectives, detectives Folkley and Bryant, I uh, sent to the detention center where they uh, advised the women of their rights and and started asking questions, but they were immediately, uh, they invoked their right to a lawyer. Each of them did. And I'm sure at this point, you're probably wondering if more victims are going to surface since you've had five in such a short time frame. Well, certainly possible. But uh, keep in mind, too, that where we arrested the suspects was with 
within a couple hundred yards of the third crime scene there uh, on Squires Road. So pretty close proximity. Not that we didn't look around. We'll just go ahead with what the next several hours and days look like on how you pace through this. Well, it was. Uh, it remained a long night. Uh, and once again, the detectives, uh, the two defendants, uh, failed to uh, give them any kind of information. So we knew that we'd have to just backtrack. Uh, but we found that we had plenty of locations to backtrack. These people were. Many people end up when they live in a large city. They ended up just occupying a very small part of it and and these girls and the and the victims were all Jennifer Road, Eastland, 3rd Street, Loudon Avenue, uh and maybe as far as Richmond Road. That was their little pie-shaped part of the county that you would almost always find them in. The two women the two women defendants were well known to police. LaFonda Foster had been in to many scrapes, uh, disorderly type things, assault type things, even a suspect in an arson before. And where Tina Powell, her offenses were generally a little bit less than that. But they were known to prostitute themselves and just whatever it took to get money for drugs and alcohol. So these were certainly no names. They're, they were not strangers to you all. Exactly. So when, when they invoked their rights and they wouldn't talk, how did you start unwinding how these people connected to each other, how they knew these victims? A lot of footwork. Uh, we did a background and checked uh, police calls for service, first of all, because that's right there in our system. And we found that police had been dispatched to the Carlos Kern's apartment uh, earlier that evening around 6 o'clock to report of a, of a disorder. Virginia Kearns was the one that called the police, and uh, she was obviously pretty highly intoxicated, perhaps even more than usual. Uh, officers, uh, I know Jerry Belcher was, was one of the officers that responded to that scene, and Jerry was quite familiar w- with them, and, and that Virginia was particularly drunk. And apparently, uh, this was a regular timing for Carlos to be running into some money. And that's when the our Sunshine Sisters would would normally show up offering sponge baths and the like. And before they'd know it, and v- what Virginia was mad about is is all of Carlos's uh, recently uh, added funds would be gone along with the girls shortly thereafter. And so that's why she had called the police, but there was no evidence of any crime uh, there, and the, and the police cleared that scene. But we think everything started going downhill from there, from what we could gather, because we start placing uh, the defendants and the victims in various locations, again, all through this one slice of Fayette County. We know that shortly after the police left that scene, that the two defendants, Foster and Powell, uh, had gone into the Rite Aid store there in the Eastland Shopping Center, this, which is walking distance, you know, uh, maybe 300 yards after crossing uh, New Circle Road to get there. And amongst other things, that at the Rite Aid store, people that work there identified them as having stolen large quantity of condoms. And once again, they were the orange-wrapped Trojans that were stolen from there, that uh, we found at virtually every scene during the initial crime investigation and uh, afterwards. Now, did all five victims know each other? I know that the two ladies had some affiliation, but did the three gentlemen know the two ladies that were also murdered? Yes, they all knew each other. Okay. Carlos Kearns' apartment, the way I understand it, was a hangout Mm -hmm. and uh, where friends would gather and and there certainly was a good amount of drinking that would go on in that area. And like I say, the, the defendants knew when to show up and, and uh, where they could score some extra cash. How do you start piecing together why this heinous crime even occurred? Well, uh, and sometimes you don't piece it all together. In this case, we didn't. All I can do is speculate, uh, but this is after weeks 
of tracing their whereabouts during the night. They stopped in a, a several locations cashing checks off of Carlos Kern. And they would try to cash a check for 50 and the place would only cash it for 20. And so they had Carlos and, and we, we've got them placed in this old Chevy. It's an old full size Chevy. And we know even where the defendants and the victims are placed in that car. And for seven of them, with at least one of them being a huge fella, it was a very packed car. So we, we know where they had gone. There was bars and, and little convenience stores. One of the bars that they went to, they, Tina Powell went inside and, and wanted to know if they had any twenty two caliber ammunition. Said he wanted to kill some rats, and uh, and meanwhile the victims are all out in the car uh, waiting on her to return. I was going to ask legwork wise, that's a lot. How how do you how does that happen? It, it, I'm assuming that these places just don't contact the police. That what's that look like personnel power wise? How do you to get to that many locations to start getting that kind of detail? What's that look like? Well, we had, uh, and robbery homicide, especially at that time, was a very small unit. I believe we were up to four detectives and myself. So uh, we borrowed a few people on a temporary duty basis from other sections of, of the Bureau of Investigation to help us out while these leads were hot. And there was plenty of them to work. So we, we used quite a few people during the course of this investigation, especially when you start adding in the crime scene detectives, the patrolmen that secured the scenes and and the like. Uh, I think there was somewhere in excess of 30 that were involved over those first couple weeks of the investigation. And basically what would happen is one lead would lead you to another. I think I mentioned earlier that the girls were allowed to keep their clothing through a pretty large mistake at the detention center. So we started interviewing people uh, at the detention center, both who worked there and both who were prisoners there. It happened to be at the same time. And we managed to run down most of the clothing. I know that Faye Foster had taken her shoelaces from her tennis shoes and flushed them down the toilet. Obviously, she couldn't do that with her shoes and uh, sweatpants and, and the like. And so we traveled around town quite a bit, running down those defendants and gathering back up the, those articles of evidence. But basically, you would go to one store and, and uh, they said, well, and they said they were going to go down to Johnny's. And so you go to Johnny's and then all they said they were going to go to Sportsman. And you would gather small amounts of information at each one. We knew where uh, associates lived around the town, and the two women, Tina Powell, lived out on Mentel Park, but they would crash wherever they could, so there was a lot of places to go, including on Jennifer. And LaFonda Foster at that time gave an address of 457 Aniston. But she hadn't been there much that, that we could prove anyways. But we would find other places like on Loudon Avenue. And once again, you'd find the orange wrap uh, Trojan condoms there. And, and somebody that saw them during the course of that evening and saw who all were together. I think I mentioned to you earlier that Roger Keene had just been released from the detention center. And I'm talking about just been released. He was walking away from the detention center. Went, and I don't know why they would have stopped and picked him up unless they thought he was easy picking for some more money because he wasn't even a part of the original scene. Nonetheless, got pulled into the car and, and uh, not against his will. And they, it was invited and, and they went on their merry way uh, several hours of driving around. And these ladies were young. Uh, they were 22 and 27. Yes. Did, did you ever get to the bottom of why they, they killed all these victims? Well, I, I think, and, and this again is speculation. This is nothing we could prove in court. We obviously proved that they did do it, but, uh, why, uh, now LaFonda Faye Foster had quite a reputation as being a very tough woman. 
apparently she'd had a very tough upbringing, and uh, and therefore she nobody would mess with her. The speculation was that Tina would go along with her because she was told to. And so my speculation and why they were, they got into the car and, and had to move around, I, I think that someone got shot at the apartment at, uh, on Jennifer Road. Now, we couldn't find anybody that heard a gunshot, but again, we're talking about a very low caliber weapon that, you know, would easily be muffled and not heard outside of the apartment. So uh, Carlos had several wounds that were pretty much superficial. One bounced off his head and one through a fleshy part of his neck. Either one of those, he could survive for quite some time. And so now their, their theft or con job is turned into a robbery and an assault first. And so the, the girls apparently at some point make the decision that everybody's got to die. It's the only way they could get by with it without being guilty of a couple of Class A felonies. I'm blown away that they just don't know what else to do, so they just kill all these people. And I'm just thinking, if you're running over top of people, how's nobody seeing that, first of all? Because, you know, that's a pretty open area over there by Burke. Uh, you're right, but now the original scene there at Burke was very much in the dark. It was uh, just a two rutted dirt road that that led in behind that hedgerow that borders up to the south end of that parking lot there at Burke Plaza. And what it appears happened is that she was originally hit and run over back in in that very dark grassy area where we found our first bits of evidence. And then it appears that she was dragged, perhaps underneath the car, out onto Mount Tabor Road just briefly, and then you basically just make a U-turn back into that Burke Plaza parking lot. I'd say it was about 50 yards of uh, scuff marks from the entrance of the parking lot to where her body came to rest. And then, presumably, they were on. Now, two questions I have. Why were these victims made to remove their clothes, and was that pre- or post-mortem? And where were the other victims while each victim was being ran over or shot or stabbed? Our best information is that they, they had them all laid out, all five of them together back in that Mount Tabor Road uh, field, and apparently summarily went down the line, but they, they had misfires uh, or just these people weren't dying. The fact that, and we think that Tina was the one with the knife, the fact that she had both of those blades out probably made that knife less effective. Uh, it sounds worse to you just thinking about two blades going in at the same time, but more than likely she wasn't gaining much penetration with them. So uh, these people were not dying quickly. So they were all lined up and killed at the same time, but the ladies were found in different locations, and then the three gentlemen were transported to a third location. Well, they weren't killed, though. Keep in mind that the running over happened at each of the three crime scenes, so I'd, I'd say none of them were dead before that happened. And like I said, uh, Carlos Kearns uh, still was alive, barely, uh, very shallow breathing and Death breaths, as I used to always call it, were just, uh, you could tell that it weren't going to be around long, but he was transported to the hospital to see if they could revive him. But the women were still toting these victims to different locations. Yes. And I'd say all of them were at some stage of injured, whether it was shallow stab wounds or gunshot wounds. Uh, and then they all got topped off by the running over. And that, that was. It would end up being the final. Was it ever figured out why they were choosing new locations instead of everybody at the same location where they had them? No. You know, and oftentimes crime just doesn't make sense. You know, this was a murder spree conducted by two women that were under the influence of, of drugs and alcohol, and it doesn't have to make sense. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. 
The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com, which is our website and has show notes for imagery and audio and video files related to the cases you're going to hear. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube, which has closed caption available for those that are hearing impaired. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.